You're now listening to the Boys in the Booth podcast with your hosts, Harper Cody, Chad Melbourne, and Casey Abrams. New episodes every Monday on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Good evening and welcome to episode 139 of the Boys in the Booth podcast. Just two-thirds of Boys in the Booth joining you for this one, Melbourne and Cody. Uh, Abrams, our pal there, Chad, uh, is delayed, I guess. He had a flight cancellation and won't be getting into Collingwood until later tonight, which, uh, you know what, it happens. And uh, so he won't be joining us tonight, but... uh, Great to great to be chatting with you, and it's just the two of us for this one. Yeah, that's right. A little bit of a schedule change with with Casey not uh, you know in this episode here. So originally we were going to keep going with our uh, season predictions for for each division, but we figured without Casey, like those episodes really work best when we have the three of us kind of going back and forth and and trying to come up with consolidated rankings like we did last episode for the Pacific. Um, so this episode, we're just going to, you know, kind of interject here in, in this flow and, and we're going to do some hot takes for the season. And then next episode, and I guess the next three, we'll continue with our division rankings. We'll do the Central, then we'll do the Metro, and then finally we'll do the Atlantic. And we did the math, we crunched the numbers, and that should still put us uh, basically right at the start of the season uh, w- after getting all three of those episodes out. So I think we're going to miss two season or two games in the nhl regular season but uh the atlantic is going to be the last one that we do so that won't the games that are being played are between nashville and san jose that we're missing so we're getting all of our projections out before any meaningful games happen so just you know for any you know armchair gms or you know the the people in the peanut gallery saying hey you guys are you know using season information to base your projections no 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 no. that's still the plan that's what we're gonna do so just a bit of a hiccup here with uh casey's flight delayed and speaking of flights also harp uh i've got the place to myself this week because Paige is catching a flight uh in about 15 minutes she's going to cincinnati for a work oh. trip oh wow yeah and then she's going to uh nashville as well kind of tag that along on, on the back half of the work trip so she'll be back uh next monday so i've got the place to myself uh for the week and then on the weekend It's my sister's birthday, so the family's coming here to Toronto to hang out. So it should be, um, you know, a bit of a relaxing week, kind of weird myself, just all alone here. And then the weekend should be filled with some excitement and uh, I'll I'll get to see, you know, the the little guy as well. So looking forward to that. There you go. Too bad uh, NHL 23 isn't out yet and you could just hang out and and play that all week. Oh, God. Don't even get me started. That... (laughs) The ratings in those games or in that oh. game that's coming out is they're just terrible. Just it's terrible. terrible every single year. <laughs> they just they just don't get it. But hey, at least there's roster sharing now. Yes. So you must have saw that I shared that on our on our page this afternoon. I was oh, like, yeah. you know, just terrible rankings for for the the top right wingers. I think it was released like. You know, uh, I think Marner is like a 90 and Patrick Kane is a 93, but he doesn't even play defense. So riddle me that. Um, But yeah, I said on our on our page, thank God roster sharing exists because the people at EA who do the ratings, I swear it's random. I I, I think they're just (laughs) pulling numbers out of a hat and just like, you know, seeing what what sticks there. So it's not good, but there is roster sharing. And of course, you know, when 23 does eventually come out here pretty soon uh we'll we'll have rosters up on xbox and playstation just like we did uh for nhl 22 yeah exactly i actually made a a list in my notes uh on on my phone just like getting ready for the release in less than a month and all the players i'm gonna need to create and all the work that goes into that but uh you know what it's uh it's enjoyable somehow but also a pain in the behind as uh, i'm sure you'll agree yeah i guess before uh you know we get into this episode here maybe we need to plan another episode you know airing out our problems with with EA Sports NHL again because when we did that in the past, you know, we talked about some of the major glitches in the previous game. 
people ate that up. Like that was mm-hmm. a really successful episode. So maybe we'll, you know, do do an episode again dedicated just to to EA NHL because you know people love to hear about it, whether good or bad, and that could be uh that, that could be a fun one for us too. Yeah, maybe uh maybe we'll do that after our division previews are all wrapped up. I like the sounds of that. Yeah. Huge shout out to SeatGeek for sponsoring the podcast. SeatGeek is a ticket app that takes all the confusion out of buying tickets. SeatGeek makes it extremely simple to buy tickets to all of your favorite sporting events, including Jays and Leafs games, and you can always find a great deal. On SeatGeek, all tickets are scored on a scale between 0 and 10, so you know if you're getting a good or a bad deal. Green is good and red is bad. Plus, Boys in the Booth listeners get $20 off their first ticket purchase on SeatGeek with the promo code Boys in the Booth in all caps. So click the link in the description to download the app and remember to get your discounted tickets using the code Boys in the Booth in all caps. Get great seats for a fraction of the cost with SeatGeek. Summer is here and you know what that means. Extreme sports like spike ball and road hockey have returned and so is day drinking. The problem is we're not as young as we used to be and these summer activities can be draining on our bodies. When you push your body hard or just feel run down, it's extremely important to stay hydrated. When you make hydration a priority, it helps you feel healthier on a day-to-day basis. Enter Liquid IV. Whether you're playing sports or nursing a hangover, Liquid IV has you covered. One stick of Liquid IV in 16 ounces of water hydrates faster and more efficiently than water alone. It contains five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and vitamin C with three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks. It's made with premium ingredients, non-GMO, and free from gluten, dairy, and soy. The kicker? This stuff tastes good too, guys. Liquid IV has incredible hydration flavors like watermelon, strawberry, pina colada, and more, but my personal favorite is lemon lime. So get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use the code BOYS underscore IN underscore THE underscore BOOTH in all caps at checkout. So that's 25% off anything when you order using the promo code BOYS underscore IN underscore THE underscore BOOTH, all caps at liquidiv.com. Experience better hydration today at liquidiv.com. Shout out to Cocktail Bomb Shop for sponsoring the podcast. Cocktail Bomb Shop is a Canadian, woman-owned, small business, and all of their cocktail bombs are proudly handmade in Montreal. Well, what is it and how does it work? Step one, you pick your favorite flavor of cocktail bomb and unwrap it. My favorite is definitely mojito. Step two, drop your cocktail bomb into eight ounces of sparkling water and watch it fizz for five minutes. Step three, add a shot of your favorite alcohol, some ice, and enjoy it. Fellas, gents, boyfriends of the world, these cocktail bombs make the perfect gift for your lady friend because not only are they tasty, but they're Instagrammable as well. Right now, if you go to cocktailbombshop.ca and use the code BITV15, you can get 15% off your entire order. That's cocktailbombshop.ca. Use the code BITV15 at checkout for 15% off. Awesome. All right. So for this one, it's just going to be a quickie. Like we said, it's just Chad and I. Uh, Case is not with us for this one. Next week, we'll get back to our division previews. So uh, thank you for your cooperation. And uh, we look forward to getting back into that with all three of us uh, back next week. So, um, Chad, what you and I are going to do is just give a couple of hot takes uh, that uh, that we have going into this 2022-23 NHL season that, believe it or not, starts up in less than a month. Uh, the uh, Prospects Tournament was uh, was happening uh, this last week and over the weekend, and uh, training camp is about to start uh, here shortly. So let's get your first of two hot takes. Sure. So... Just to begin with uh, these hot takes here, I do just want to say that they actually are very hot takes. I feel like in the past, um, you know, we've had some some medium takes, some warm takes, you know, that aren't very adventurous or out there. And then they end up coming true and we pat ourselves on the back. And and, you know, so I just want to clarify that none of that will be happening, at least from me today. I've got two very hot takes, uh, but I do think that there is an argument to be made for both. So the first one, 
uh, that I'm going to start with here. My first hot take is that Kirill Kaprizov will win the Hart Trophy this upcoming NHL season. And here's my rationale, okay? Last year, uh, you know, of course, Austin Matthews won the Hart Trophy, um, had a phenomenal year, scored 60 goals. uh, But there were some other big names who were in the running. And, you know, believe it or not, Kirill Kaprizov was one of those names. He didn't finish top three. He ended up finishing, uh, I believe, seventh in Hart Trophy voting. But he was at least in the conversation among uh, the hockey writers who do vote on this trophy. So... Last year, Kaprizov had 47 goals, okay, 61 assists for 108 points in a full game or a full season played, so 80, 81 out of 82 games. Um, and also through six games in the playoffs, he had seven goals, an assist, and eight points. So amazing playoff as well. Not that that matters for the Hart Trophy, but just kind of you know showing how crazy of a player this is um like i said he was seventh in heart trophy voting right now he's plus 1400 on all of the major um sports betting platforms which ranks him fifth in voting odds among all players in the nhl for the heart trophy so fifth there's definitely some good value there you know the likes of uh connor mcdavid austin matthews uh kale mccarr i think nathan mckinnon are, are so I think those are the four above him, and he ranks fifth at plus fourteen hundred. A couple weeks ago, I put ten bucks on Kaprizov to win the Hart Trophy at that number plus fourteen hundred. So this is something that I've believed in for a while, and it's going to be kind of my horse all season as we go along here. Um, now the rationale why I think you know he's going to improve from from that seventh spot in, in voting to to number one. Well, this year something different. Um, compared to last year is that he's not going to have his running mate, Kevin Fiala, beside him. So, you know, some people might look at that and think, you know, maybe that means his production will take a bit of a dip. Um, and, and fair enough, that could be the case. But I just think if Kaprizov can put up another season with similar numbers, breaking 100 points again, scoring 50 goals, because remember last year he had 47, was very close. If he could put together a season like that and kind of drag Minnesota to the playoffs. You know, a lot of people are saying that Minnesota might take a step back without the scoring of Fiala. So if he's able to drag them to the playoffs and have another incredible year without the guy who finished second on the team in scoring last year, Kevin Fiala, I think that makes a really good case to the writers for him being the most valuable player to his team, which to remind you, that is the definition of the Hart Trophy. Yeah. Um, a couple other things here, and then I'll I'll let you jump in, get your opinion. I'm going to need a drink of water here soon. Uh, <laughs> Zuccarello was one of the only other players on the team last year who was over a point per game. It was Zuccarello, uh, Kaprizov, and Fiala. So he'll still have Zuccarello uh, on that top line with him, which is a plus. Uh, but I don't think people look at pe- at players like Zuccarello or even some of the younger guys coming up on the team like Boldy or Rossi as real like drivers you know like I feel like for the Hart Trophy the argument always gets made whether it's about Connor McDavid Leon Dreisaitl uh, Austin Matthews etc that you know they're only one piece of the puzzle on a top line and they get you know extreme amounts of help from other players who they play with so that kind of goes against them in their quest to win the Hart Trophy. But I don't think Kaprizov is going to have that argument made against him this year because it it looks to me anyways, when I look at this team on paper in in their top six forward group, it, it seems to me like Kaprizov is on a bit of an island by himself as the sole driver, the sole producer, the guy who's going to be looked to to really carry this team offensively. So um that's really my argument. The final thing I'll say is that uh, Dom LeCision, as we know from The Athletic, runs a pretty accurate model uh, for fantasy projections, uh, team scoring projections, and, uh, you know, is the big numbers guy, basically, at The Athletic. He projects Kaprizov to score 44 goals, 51 assists, and 95 points this season. So of all the projections of, of total points for players, Dom, Dom's is the one I trust the most. So with all of that combined, it seems like Kaprizov is poised to have another great season with less help on a team who is expected to take a step back. 
who, and I think he'll be able to will them to the playoffs. So that is my my big rant, Harp. That's my argument for why I think Kirill Kaprizov could win the heart. Now I want to hear your thoughts because that was that was quite a lot. <laughs> no worries. Uh, I like it. I think Kaprizov is a driver, and he is a superstar now in the National Hockey League. Um, and that was a pretty wide open heart trophy race for a big chunk of the season last year and i think we could see the same kind of thing this nhl season and uh the odds are certainly there for kaprizov a little bit down the list uh like you said at plus was it plus 1200 or 1400 1400 that's 1400 right. yeah so uh, you know what I, I like those odds man and yeah he's he's gonna have to be a driver offensively for minnesota who i still think is a good team i know that um there are some doubters out there with with the cap situation that they're in but with a young player like Matthew Boldy who came in and was just fantastic I mean you've got Eric Sinek, who's a very um, defensively responsible center and and uh, can win a lot of faceoffs and and that. So I think Kaprizov is going to be just fine, and uh, it's still a good team, and he's a driver for them. The guy is just absolutely electrifying to watch, and so I, I like it, man. I, I I really do. If Minnesota is going to make the playoffs and uh, continue to to push and be a contender, even with the salary cap situation that they're in, Kaprizov is going to be a huge part of that. So I like it. Yeah, I look at this season that I'm expecting from Kaprizov this year, this Hart Trophy caliber season, as you know, comparable to Taylor Hall a few years ago when he won the Hart Trophy on a team who you know, like I guess the Devils at that point weren't really expected to be very good and Taylor Hall did you know put the team on his back and get to the playoffs um so it it is a bit different but I see them kind of the same like you're relying on one guy to sort of drive your offense and and like believe me I'm not trying to take anything away from from other players on Minnesota like even a guy like uh Ryan Hartman had like 65 points last year yeah. You know, and and like you said, Boldy, when he played, he stepped up. You know, I think he had over 30 points in in like 45 games or something. So like they've got a lot of guys. So I'm not trying to take anything away from those players. I just think in terms of high end talent, there's really only that one guy like, you know, you've got your players who can sniff a point per game. But, you know, I feel like every team has those players. You just you know, not every team has a Kirill Kaprizov, a guy who can get, you know, this year, depending on how the season goes, 115 points, you know, like he had 108 last year. Yeah. 108. So yeah, 115, I don't think is out of the question. And if a season like that comes from Kaprizov, man, I think I'm going to be in the money here for, for him winning the Hart Trophy. Jeez, yeah, that could be a nice payday for you there, uh, Chad. <laughs> and uh, you know what? If we if we continue to see the level of offense that we did last season, which I think we will, like there's just, you know, the guys are just so good now and they know how to score goals. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think, yeah, I agree. Like over 100 points again for Kaprizov and for maybe multiple seasons to come is not out of the question. The guy's a superstar. Yeah. All right. So uh, I'll go with uh, my first hot take. And uh, you took a team uh, or a player on a team in the Central Division, which we're going to get to next week, of course, as we mentioned earlier. So I'll stick with that. And I'm going to talk about a forward on the Dallas Stars who has yet to be signed, of course, and that is RFA Jason Robertson. So my hot take is this, Chad. I think that we are going to get into into the regular season we're going to get into some games in the regular season and jason robertson is still going to be holding out for that new contract um 
I'm a little concerned about this one for the Dallas Stars, man, for a couple of reasons. Obviously, the comments by owner uh, Tom uh, G- uh, Gaglardi, and uh, you look at the contracts that were just handed out for guys like Cairo and Tim Stutzla. They're just over $8 million a year. Robertson, 45 points. And then 79 last year with 41 goals. The guy has already produced more than those two players that I just mentioned. He's coming off a 41-goal season. And uh, this this guy wants to get paid, man. And, uh, you know, the the Stars just don't seem to want to do that right now. I think there's more of a desire to... Do a, a bridge deal there with with uh, you know a, a lower AAV, but man, he's a hell of a player and a star for them. And uh, I just I, I'd like to see the stars get him locked up for for a long time as soon as possible. But here we are, we're getting close to the start of the season, less than a month away. Robertson is still unsigned, and uh, you know, just the comments from the owner and everything. So I'm looking at this as potentially a uh, a William Nylander situation from a few years back, and I think we're going to get into the regular season a little bit, and Robertson is going to be unsigned. What do you think? I mean... That seems like a hot take that I could get behind because like I was thinking about this a couple weeks ago, man, like as these deals have started to roll out, you know, the two guys in uh, St. Louis and then the Tim Stutzla deal and and everybody in between, like it just seems like something's got to give for Robertson, you know, especially since uh, the, they did the deal with Ottinger as well. Like it, they're clearly trying And it feels like something's got to give. But if you're Robertson and and you're Robertson's camp, you know, and you're just looking at the raw numbers, you have a lot of leverage here based on the amount of money that's been given out this offseason. So I could definitely see that happening. Um, I just pulled up the stars cap friendly right now. And like they don't have a lot of space to work with. That's the problem right now. So they've got about six million bucks in uh, projected cap space for this season. And if you're projecting a contract for Robertson, you know, a guy who who broke into the league and has just torn it up ever since been a point per game player. Uh, Not only that, but coming off the 40 goal season, which, you know, I think people think that 30 goal seasons grow on trees now because of you know how scoring has seen an increase over the last couple of years but that's still a hard hard thing to do 40 goals in, in an NHL season um, you know especially being as young and inexperienced as Robertson you know the kid is only 23 years old so that is extremely impressive in in its own right if you're Robertson like do you take a bridge deal and bet on yourself you know maybe do like a um oh i don't even know like i'm thinking about numbers here well i know uh, like for a bridge deal like elliot friedman's been saying a lot like a seven times three kind of thing um but man it like if i'm robertson in his camp and seeing those deals that i mentioned earlier like for guys like Cairo and stutzla yeah are you not looking at those and the way that he's produced and and kind of thinking like nine times eight or eight and a half times eight or I something see, like i would even man. say nine and a half yeah exactly like the guy the guy deserves to get paid but the dallas stars are in a tough spot and as we know they're still committed for a few years yet to the two veterans in in sagan and ben and let's not forget that they have to get rupe hints done after this season as well and that's not going to be a cheap one either. And just looking at it as well, like, you know, you've got a few others to get done next season as well. Like a Gurianov, you know, will be relatively cheap compared to a guy like Hintz, but still that's yeah. money that... If, if he sticks around, for sure. Yeah, that's money you've got to allocate, but yeah, man, like just looking at it, it doesn't <laughs> seem like anything, you know, like the, imagine if they signed Klingberg. <laughs> <laughs> like what oh. their cap situation would be now. Jeez. So yeah, I exactly listen, that's a hot take harp that I can get behind because to me, I don't see a solution right now, especially if you're Jason Robertson and you're thinking, you know, I'm worth 9.5. 
on a long-term deal like what what incentive do you have to sign for less like sure you want to play hockey but you know if if he holds out until say even december you know say it is a william nylander situation that could be a way to to kind of maximize your money long term and and just in closing to to that and before we get on to your next hot take there chad i think that um you know sort of we're seeing contracts change obviously guys come out of their entry level deals or their next bridge deals or whatever and they absolutely break out and then they get paid we we saw that with tage thompson with with the deal that he just got with the sabers and i think that teams are looking at the situation that the calgary flames got into and I know I'm not the only one to say this, so I'm not trying to take credit for for this, but um, teams are looking at that and they're like, you know what, we are going to lock up these young players for as long as we can, as soon as we can. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is to do that, you don't want to subtract from your team. And it looks like the stars would have to do that if they want to sign Robertson long term. Um, Another thing I'll say on this too is that, you know, as we've seen this summer, you know, you mentioned the the Tage Thompson deal. There's been a shitload of money handed out, which leads me to believe that GMs know something that the public doesn't at this point, or GMs uh, are are predicting that the cap is going to skyrocket in the next couple years. Um, We heard. Ah, who was it? We heard Alan Walsh. You know Alan Walsh, the um, the uh, player agent for a ton of, of players. Yeah, so Alan Walsh predicted on his podcast, Agent Provocateur, that the cap will go up within the next couple years su- substantially. And by that, meaning, you know, getting upwards of, of almost $90 million. Yeah. Because the problem right now is that there's a lot of money in escrow from the covid shutdown you know as they renegotiated how to split the the earnings for the league between the players and the owners so there's a lot of money owed in escrow right now uh to the owners still from the players but then after that like we saw record record revenue last season um you know with the new tnt deal projected record revenue again this season so you know you would expect the cap to go up as soon as the kind of lingerings from the COVID situation, uh, you know, are over. But I don't know, man, the amount of money being given out this off season, it seems like GMs already have a number in mind because they're yeah. trying to get long-term deals done right now. And if you're the Dallas stars signing a three-year deal for say, you know, six and a half or something for, for Robertson or seven, whatever it takes or a two year deal at, at seven, you know, that could be the worst decision made for for the franchise because then what happens in two or three years the kid's going to be worth you know 12 he could be so <laughs> yeah like, yeah exactly it, it's a risky and, uh, business exactly and you know with with the term being given out this summer four years seem to be kind of that number um you know four years kind of turned into the new two years and but i just with dallas like there's just been there have been some deals kind of handed out the past couple off seasons that you know just didn't make a lot of sense like the the suitor deal for example and then four and a half times four years for uh, mason marchment this summer and when you know that you have robertson ottinger who they got done and rupe hints all coming down the pipe you really have to manage your cap and especially in this sort of flat cap era that we're uh coming to the end of it sounds like it's really important to to manage your finances and so here we are and i'm glad you're on board with this hot take because he's still not signed and it's a big deal the guy's earned it and he's a star um yeah i just think this is a situation that uh, the stars could be in yeah, for sure. Okay, my second hot okay. take then. Uh, and this is, you know, the reason why I've got a Maple Leafs jersey behind me right now. I had to sneak in some Maple Leafs content to an episode because we're not talking about the Atlantic for a few weeks now. So, um, you know, non Leafs fans, you're going to roll your eyes at this. But this is a bit of a hot take. Um, and, 
you know, I don't think it's likely to happen, but I could definitely see it happening. Uh, and I've got an argument for it. So here it is. Right. Matt Murray, the new goaltender for the Toronto Maple Leafs, the new starting goaltender for the Toronto Maple Leafs, will not only earn a career high in wins in a season, but will also have a 912 plus save percentage this year. That's my hot take. What, what, what's your initial thought to that before I kind of explain my, my rationale? I mean, all of the resources for Matt Murray to bounce back are there, right? You've got a general manager and a head coach who both know him very well. I can't remember the goalie coach's name right now, the guy that he's working with. But I mean, from what I've heard and read that that should be a very good arrangement as well. Look, it was a disaster in, in Ottawa. And before that, you know, Matt Murray was a, a decent goaltender and obviously one won two Stanley Cups back-to-back with Pittsburgh. Look, this is a team that obviously hasn't had that playoff success. They haven't been able to get out of the first round in the last six years, but they're a good hockey team, especially in the regular season. They put up a ton of points, and you know what? I I, I really think that Murray could have a, a, a bounce-back season. Um, yeah, for sure. I... I don't mind this at all. Yeah. So just for some context here, like the first part of this is Matt Murray will earn a career high in wins. Um, His career high is 32 and he achieved that back in 2016, 17 with Pittsburgh, uh, obviously. And that was his last, you know, really elite year in the NHL. He was incredible that season. Um, Last season, he went five, 12 and two which was an atrocious record with Ottawa, also played a game or two in the AHL. Um, So that, you know, isn't something that you love on your resume this far into your career. He had a 305 goals against average last season and a 906 save percentage. But on the bright side, he is a 911 goalie, a 911 save percentage goalie, uh, you know, throughout his career on average. And despite those poor surface level numbers on Ottawa last year, he had a positive goal saved above expected. Not by much, but about four goals that he saved above what he was expected to, given the opportunities that he faced. So that's encouraging to hear. You know, goalie guys love that number. Stats guys love that number. So it, it, it's a good thing to hear, and it's definitely encouraging. Um, he'll be playing on the Maple Leafs, obviously who are a much better defensive team going into this season than the Ottawa Senators were last year. So for example, last year, the Sens allowed the seventh most expected goals against, which is, you know, bottom third of the league. They allowed a ton of opportunities and a ton of really, really great A opportunities. And Matt Murray, you know, did his best last season to stop those. Compared to the Maple Leafs, who allowed the six sixth fewest expected goals against last season so they were among the very best defensive teams in the nhl so just looking at all of that evidence i think you know when you combine that with the fact that you know he's he's a childhood maple leafs fan and the toronto maple leafs have some of the best resources in terms of being able to get players healthy again and we've seen that with with tons of players in the past you know whether it be Andre Kasha, for the most part, you know, he really benefited from the Maple Leafs, you know, uh, health and and medical team. Uh, A guy like Tyler Ennis in the past really benefited as well. You know, when, when all of that is combined, I just think that Matt Murray is going to prove a ton of people wrong this season. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping that this comes true and and he gets a career high in wins with, uh, you know, anything over 32 and a save percentage above 912, which would be slightly above his career average of 0.911. But I think, you know, in the right situation, playing, you know, the majority of the games in a in a kind of tandem situation with Samsonov as sort of the designator designated 1A starter to Samsonov's 1B, I think it just makes a lot of sense. And You know, that's kind of my hot take. And the reason it's hot is because people are down on Matt Murray after a couple poor years in Ottawa. But like I said, I think he's really going to surprise people this year. I think he's in the perfect situation to do so. 
Yeah, uh, I could see it, man. Like I said, all of the the resources are there for him to bounce back. And uh, Ottawa was just it, it just wasn't a good fit. It was just a bad situation right from the get go. A team that, um, you know, they were trying to take the next step, and they certainly have uh, this off season. And uh, they just they weren't a very good hockey team when Matt Murray was there. And at the end of the day. That uh, that's what happened. And, um, you know, I think that uh, being in this situation now in Toronto, being around some familiar people that he'll be recharged and re-energized. And it's not like Marie is going to have to go out and play 55 games for this hockey club. I mean, you know, anything could happen. But you've got Ilya Samsonov, who's a good young goaltender there as well. So they'll be splitting the load and um, uh, I, I do like the idea of Matt Murray having a bounce back year. That's for sure. Yeah. So, Chad, it's kind of funny. And just so our listeners know, like, we don't give anything away to each other that we're going to talk about before we get on to to do an episode like this. So, oh, should we have? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I say that because, funny enough, uh, I also went with a goaltender for a hot take who is on the Buffalo Sabres. So we've got a bit of Sabres talk to finish it off. I know who you know uh, I'm going to talk about, and uh, and that is Eric Comrie, who signed a two-year contract in the offseason, had a nice... Had a nice year with uh, with the Winnipeg Jets, kind of a breakout year. But uh, he's going to be counted on to play more games, obviously, for the Sabres, a team that finished the regular season off uh, very strongly under Don Granado last season, and they're looking to take the next step. And so it's likely going to be Comrie and Craig Anderson as the tandem. Uh, They want UPL to play some more games down in Rochester, although if he has a good camp, you never know. We could be looking at Comrie and and Lukanen, but uh, I am expecting it to be Comrie and Anderson, obviously with Anderson being, you know, 40 plus years old he's not going to be able to go out and play, you know, 40 plus games or whatever. So I, I'm looking at Eric Comrie as having a, kind of a, a breakthrough season and, and playing uh, playing more games on a, on a young team on the rise. And so just looking at some of his numbers, Chad, uh, he's got a small sample size in the NHL, just 28 games played, but he's got a, a winning record. He's 13, 10 and one. Uh, with a 905 save percentage last season alone uh 10.3 Goals saved above expected. So uh, a very good stat line for him as far as uh, that is concerned. And uh, he's he's only 27 years old. And I should mention as well that that 10.3 GSAX was uh, 14th best last season. So, um, you know, he's, he's kind of entering that prime age in his career. And... A comparable for Eric Comrie that I kind of look at is uh, the way that Jack Campbell kind of broke out at that age. And so, um, you know, he's playing on the Sabres, a team that's only going to get better, a team that uh, on defense has Rasmus Dahlin and Owen Power in front of him. And uh, I think this could be a a really nice fit and uh, a sneaky good signing by the Sabres. So I'm looking at 27-year-old Eric Comrie to break out this year so thoughts on my final hot take i personally don't think it's that hot of a take i I actually really like this one eric Comrie was a guy for me who was on my kind of wants list as a tandem option for the maple Leafs. so you know he's someone i've kind of had my eyes on for a while because of those numbers that you just shared in a small sample size from last year so 19 games played having a 920 save in winnipeg like Winnipeg was okay last year, but they fell short of, you know, expectations, all things considered. So being able to put up numbers like that and then have, you know, the the good underlying uh, advanced numbers as well. That's that's just great to hear. Like, I love how he has both. And and so you, I think it makes a lot of sense looking forward to this season and expecting him to to break out as well and by the way i will say i love how 
now that we are like four or, or whatever years into the podcast now, that you're finally getting into some advanced numbers. Because that's an easy one. The goal saved above expected. It's my favorite one because it's so easy. It assigns a number that, you know, to a goalie. And it's easy to to comprehend. And I think it's a really good stat. So kudos to you for for using those numbers. But but no, man, like Eric Comrie, I think the comparable to Jack Campbell is actually like that got me. That makes a lot of sense too. you know, a guy who is, who is kind of bounced up and down between the NHL and the AHL and has played in a backup role for a while. The thing with Comrie though, is that I like, it's hard to predict goalies in the first place. Right? So the thing for Comrie is how many games is he going to play? And will he be able to, sort of maintain the form that he was in last year through a larger sample size. So that's what I worry about a little bit for Comrie, um, especially playing behind the Sabres who, you know, they've got a lot of good pieces, but I think we can agree they're not expected to be a playoff team or, you know, I think they're a bubble team though, which, you know, they're, they're definitely improving, but yeah, I think, you know, it, it is a hot take expecting Comrie to, to kind of jump out and, and, you know, have a, have a standout year or, or a breakout year. But at the same time, you know, over the last few seasons, all signs kind of point to this if, if he's given a bigger opportunity. So I don't mind that one harp. I don't mind that pick at all. All right. Perfect. Yeah. Look at me dropping these (laughs) advanced stats. Now I'm uh, turning into an analytics guy. So there we go. That's right. (laughs) <laughs> all righty well uh that uh that's good stuff chad so a, a couple of hot takes uh, from each of us going into this nhl season and uh again uh next week we will get back into our uh division preview talk with the central division so uh thanks so much for listening to this one and uh we will chat with you again next week This has been another episode of Boys in the Booth with Harper Cody, Chad Melbourne, and Casey Abrams. New episodes every Monday on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Connect with the Boys in the Booth on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Boys in the Booth. Visit boysinthebooth.com for show details. And don't forget, you can become a patron of the podcast for just $1 a month at www.patron.com slash boysinthebooth.